Welcome everyone to Christian Biblical Church of God's uh, Friday night online service or Bible study or message or me uh, meeting that we have every week. Uh, we go around the world and, and it in involves all the scattered brethren around the world and there, there are many and they're in various places, diverse places, and uh, we all get to come together in one room as a family and meet and enjoy one another's company and hear a message and enjoy a edifying and uplifting discussion afterwards. So tonight uh, we're gonna hear from our elder in Cincinnati and uh, he is going to speak on love covers all sins. And I introduce to you, Tom Fannin. Well, hello brethren and welcome to another study on the GoTo meeting. It's, it's very nice to, to be with you and, and hopefully you're all well and uh, looking forward to the Sabbath, whether you're getting ready to start it as we are here or you're already in the midst of it. So with the message here, as Steve mentioned, we, it's titled, Love Covers All Sins. So let's, let's start by turning back to Proverbs, the 10th chapter, and we'll see where this is mentioned. Proverbs 10. And I want to go down to verse 12 of Proverbs 10. It says here, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. So when we read this, we see we have a couple of things going on here, don't we? A couple of attitudes you may see. We have a, an attitude where it says hatred stirs up strife. An attitude, maybe you can say that uh, one that wants to stir up sin, wants to stir up problems among people. Maybe you can say this is an attitude, too, where these are the type of people that are against God, against God's law and what God wants us to be doing. But the second part of it here says, but love covers all sins. And certainly that's what we want, don't we, is to have sin covered. You know, in our lives, uh, we don't want to be a part of sin, do we? Those of us who are spiritual. You know, and at times too, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, sometimes this scripture is misapplied. So we'll mention that a little bit later. So what I want to cover here in this message is this uh, sin and love and examining why love covers sin. What's the part love plays in covering sin? Most importantly, God and Christ, what they've done for us to cover sin, and also our part. What's our part in the covering of sin? The love we should have, the same love that God and Christ has. So let's talk a little bit about truly how is love covered when we think about the covering of, or excuse me, sin covered when we think about sin and how it's truly covered, we know that came from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So let's turn and read read a couple of scriptures regarding that. First of all, let's go to 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2, verse 21, it says, for it would have been, uh, 1 Peter 2, I'm sorry, and yes, in verse 21, it says, for this uh, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example um, that we should uh, follow in his footsteps. And, and, you know, that should be in the front of our mind always is the example Christ set for us. When we read scripture about Christ, especially the Gospels, we see what he did and how he conducted himself before God and before man. It says, who committed no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When suffering he threatened not, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins within his own body on the tree, so that we, being dead to sins, may live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. 
So we see that Christ, he bore our sins, didn't he? Turn back now to Hebrews 7. Let's read a couple more scriptures on this back in Hebrews 7. In verse 25, this is speaking of Christ here, it says, Therefore he has the power throughout all time to save those who come to God through him because he is ever living to intercede for them. For it is fitting that we should have such a high priest who is holy, blameless, undefiled, set apart from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who has no need, as do the other high priests, to offer up sacrifices day by day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. So again, Christ offered up himself to cover sin. And then one more scripture and let's turn to 1 John 2. In 1 John 2 verse 1, John writes here, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And yet, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is the propitiation, or you can say a continuous atonement, for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the world. So again, Christ is that atoning sacrifice for our sins, so that sin can truly be covered. So, uh, one part that we have to mention here is repentance, isn't it? You know, through Christ's sacrifice uh, and upon repentance, sin is covered. Our sins are forgiven, but we have to remember repentance. And I, I mentioned earlier about the scripture there in Proverbs 10, verse 12, sometimes being misapplied. But we have to remember the covering of sin also requires repentance on an individual. So... With the covering of sin with love, we know what God and Jesus Christ have done for us is an act of love. It was an act of love on both their behalf. So we'll turn to John 3.16, which makes this very clear. John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have everlasting life. And sometimes that's really hard to think about, that we know that Christ, who was, who was God, uh, divulged himself of his power and became a pinpoint of life and became a man, for sacrifice for us to become the only begotten Son of God the Father. So, but this was done, we know, for for us and for the world, for everyone, as an act of love. John 15, let's turn there. John 15, and starting in verse 9, it says, As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Christ speaking to the apostles here. Live in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall live in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and live in his love. These things I have spoken to you in order that my joy may dwell in you and that your joy may may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do whatever, I command you. So Christ in this act of love we know did lay down his life for an example for us. So 
I think sometimes it's good for us to think about what Christ said here about the laying down of his life and what do we need to be doing ourselves for each other in our personal sacrifices, our laying down of our lives for one another. Again, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, to cover sin, our part in covering sin. Let's go back now to uh, 1 John 4. First John 4, verse 8, it says, The one who does not uh, love does not know God because God is love. And that's, that makes it very clear for all of us what God is. And the same for Jesus Christ. But it says God is love. In this way, the love of God was manifested toward us, towards us that God sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this act is the love, not that we love God, rather that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. So, again, just some scriptures there to cover that what happened here uh, was an act of love on the part of God and Jesus Christ. So we need the love of Christ, the love of God and Christ has within ourselves. And we know that that's something we strive for every day is to love God with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our minds, with all our being, and also to love each other. And that's what we continually work on. Continuing on in John, 1 John 4, verse 11, it says, Beloved, beloved if God so loved us, we are also duty-bound to love one another. No one has seen God at any time, yet if we love one another, God dwells in us, and his own love is perfected in us. And that's something that we need to be working on continually, is having the love of God being perfected in us, so we can be like him, so we can be like Christ, and be building their mind and their very character. And now in verse 21, it says, and this is the commandment that we have heard from him, that the one who loves God should also love his brother. So as we look at this, we apply this towards the covering of sin. And so we'll continue on with that thought a little bit later. But love for one another does help in the covering of sin. So how is God dealt with us how has God dealt with you personally how is, is that something we all think about you know oftentimes uh, I think it's good to meditate on this before before uh, prayer to think about what God has done for us in our lives uh, what God brought us out of who we are and also who we are now and, and also the problems we have now in our spiritual lives that we need help with. And it's good to meditate on what God has done for us. And then also our attitude towards one another and how we deal with one another just as God has dealt with us. So let's read back in Psalm 103rd chapter. Verse 8. It says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abundant in steadfast love. And isn't that something to thank God about continually, is his love is steadfast. It doesn't change. Every day he has the same love for us. Unlike how we are at times, God's love is steadfast. It says, he will not always chasten, nor will he keep his anger forever. For he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so his mercy towards those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So that's how God has dealt with us 
mercy, forgiving us, patient, slow to anger. That's how God works with us through his love. Matthew 18, let's turn back there. Matthew 18 and verse 12, it says, What do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that go astray. Likewise, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And that's God's love towards all people. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants all to come to repentance. And there's joy when the one is found, the one that has gone astray. You know, when we think about looking for the ones that go astray, this is what God does. You know, sometimes in our lives, uh, we go astray, don't we? And we do things or have thoughts or get into, uh, get into certain attitudes at times that aren't right. We go astray. But God continues to lurk, look for us and search for us and bring us back with his love. And we have a chance to repent and change and move forward. So this is part of what God is and what he does. Luke 6. Let's turn back there. Luke 6, in verse 36, it, sa it says, Therefore, you also be compassionate, even as your Father is compassionate. And do not judge others, so that you yourself will not be judged in any way. Do not condemn others, so that you will not be condemned in any way. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. So God, as Christ says here, is a, his Father is a compassionate father we have a compassionate father and uh, what what a great attribute it is to have compassion for people and that's what God has and he wants us to have that attitude as well he wants us to be forgiving he wants us to be not judgmental of one another and if we have this about us then this goes a long way towards the covering of sin as far as our part. Hosea 6, let's turn back there. Hosea 6. Let's drop down to verse 6. So it says here, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And isn't that what God wants? He doesn't want sacrifices in, in the times here where they were sacrificing animals for sin and the sprinkling of blood. But what God wants is to be able to extend mercy. He wants to see in us a circumcised heart one that wants to change and wants to repent. Wants to, one that wants to have sin covered. And also God desires that we have knowledge of who he is, who God really is. And we just covered that in John, that God's love. But he wants us to have knowledge of who he is and what he desires. And also the truth. That's what God wants is us to have this attitude, but especially the knowledge of love because of what love does in our lives. So how do you view sin? How do, how do all of us look at sin? I mean, is it something that, you know, because of this world and what goes on in this world and uh, sometimes even closer to home in our families and um, 
and as we'll talk about a little later even in the church, how do we view sin? What do we think of sin? And you know, ultimately, can sin and love dwell together? And we know the final answer to that is there is a future time where sin will not exist anymore, but love will certainly cover everything. But right now, that's not what we have. We have sin. So how do we view it? What do we think of sin? Well, we always want to start with what does God think? It's really, you know, what, what we think isn't important. But what God thinks is very important. That's what we need to be paying attention to. Let's turn back to Psalm 5, and David speaks of this in Psalm 5. Psalm 5 and verse, uh, verse 4. It says, For you are not a God that has pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boasters shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. So that's God's view on sin. That's God's view on wickedness. That's God's view on evil. He doesn't choose to dwell with that. He doesn't want that to be a part of his life. He doesn't want that to be a part of our lives either, and he wants us to have the same type attitude, that we want that removed. Let's turn back now to Romans, the sixth chapter. Romans 6, and when we talk about baptism, we we cover this because it has to do with submersion, the bearing of the old self, the co being co-crucified with Jesus Christ, and then becoming in covenant with God in Christ. So Romans 6, let's pick it up in verse 14. So, you know, when, we, when we're baptized and we are in covenant, we made an agreement in that covenant, didn't we? We said we would walk as Jesus Christ walked. And we would be living by God's word. Keeping his commandments. That's something we agreed to. Romans 6.14, it says, For sin shall not rule over you, because you are not under law, but under grace. That's what happened when we were baptized. And when we received the Holy Spirit, we became under grace. It says, What then shall uh, sin? Uh, shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. Don't you realize that to whom you yield yourselves as servants to obey, you are servants of the one you obey, whether it is of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness? But thanks be to God that you are the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. And having been delivered from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So that's where our mind should be. Sin should not be ruling anymore within us. We should be working on getting sin out, having sin covered by repentance and change. But the important thing here is to become servants of righteousness and to let righteousness and love rule. That's what we need to be doing in our lives after baptism. Proverbs 28, let's turn back there. And again, we're talking about how do we view sin? What do you, what do you think of sin? Proverbs 28 and... I'm just going to read verse 13. It says, He who covers his sins shall not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. So that sounds like New Covenant doctrine, doesn't it? So 
we definitely, from a standpoint, don't want to be covering sins, thinking that we can hide sins from God, right? Because we, we know we cannot hide our sins from God. But we want to confess them and forsake them, right? And then have mercy. And that is truly New Testament doctrine. That's what we need to be doing is forsaking sin and confessing sin. Let's turn back now to 1 John, the first chapter. First John 1 and verse 7. It says, However, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, as speaking of Christ, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his own Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we do not have sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, just like we read there in Proverbs, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So all of us as brethren, that's what we need to do all of us together is walk in the light and look for the covering again by repentance, by confessing. Because we all walk in the light together. And those of us who are in the light together, there's a lot we do for one another to help in this. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 13 now. 1 Corinthians 13. And we know this as the, the love chapter. In 1 Corinthians 13 and in verse 5, it says here what love doesn't do, and it says it love does not behave disgracefully, does it? It says it does not seek its own things. It is not easily provoked, and it doesn't think evil. Love doesn't. And in verse 6, it says does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. So, you know, the world, when you look at the world, sometimes it seems to rejoice in sin. But not for us, who are spiritual, right? We have... Uh, we don't rejoice in iniquity. We don't rejoice in sin. Actually, we're saddened by sin. It hurts when we see sin within this world and within the church and within ourselves. And it's something we should want to cover and get rid of. But we should be rejoicing in the truth. That's that. For us who are spiritual, that's where our true rejoicing is. It's, it's in God's word. It's in the truth. That's what we truly rejoice in. Now, part of this is having joy, and we need to have joy. Because God has joy, and so do the angels. And we'll read about that in Luke 15 when it comes to Forsaking sin, leaving sin. Luke 15. In verse 4, we'll cover the, the parable that we covered there a little bit ago in Matthew 18. It says, which man of you who has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost, searching until he finds it? <clears throat> and when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And after coming to his house, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, I have found my sheep that was lost. And I tell you likewise, there shall be joy in heaven over one sinner who repents more than over 99 righteous ones who have 
no need of repentance. Verse 8, Or what woman who has ten coins, if she should lose one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search diligently until she finds it? And after finding it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I lost. I tell you that in like manner there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So there's rejoicing in heaven. There's joy. There's joy with God. There's joy with Christ. There's joy with the angels when one repents, when one comes back. When one is found, isn't there? And that's the attitude we should have, is joy. We should have joy when we see this occur. I know um, a couple of uh, weeks ago at our local fellowship group, we had two baptisms. And it worked out there that uh, we were able to use one of the uh, uh, brethren's uh, family pool, and we had everything planned out that we'd have our uh, service there, and then after the service, we would uh, leave and go to the pool for the baptisms, and we did that. It was a really pretty day. It was warm, and we were able to baptize two people. Uh, we made it a special day. It was a special Sabbath, and then we all came back together after that and had a meal together. You know, there was rejoicing that day. And what happened? And what what a special day when you have baptisms. You know, I I think that when a day when a baptism occurs, there's nothing more important going on at that moment in time than that event of a baptism where a person repents and accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior and becomes a literal begotten Son of God or daughter of God. But there was joy that day. We had joy. We rejoiced on that Sabbath. And that's what God wants us to have is joy in repentance and in the covering of sin. And hopefully that is our attitude when we see people change and repent and come out of this world. That there's joy. Rather than joy helps cover sin. So we need to extend love towards each other, don't we? So our part, I keep mentioning our part, and we're going to spend some time now talking about our part in the covering of sin. Because we do have a part in this. Proverbs 17. Verse 9, it says, He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter alienates friends. And I've seen this happen before, and I'm sure you have too, where a person, instead of acting in love, has repeated a matter, and it's caused a lot of damage between people. So, for us, seeking love is having an attitude where we want it covered, the transgression of others, and doing our part. So yes, our attitude towards this when others sin, and how we react to it and what we do, has a big part in the covering. Something we have to be mindful of because, again, I've, I've seen this and maybe you have too. Things that occur where things are talked about and repeated, that's very damaging. We don't want to do that. Colossians 3. Let's turn back there. Colossians 3 and verse 12. It says, Put on then as the elect of God, holy and beloved, deep inner affections, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, so also 
you should forgive. And boy, this is something we need to keep in mind, isn't it, that Christ forgave us. But this, these are the actions we need to have towards one another. In 14 it says, and above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So as we are being perfected or love is being perfected in us, love is the bond of all these things. And if we're doing these things towards one another, again, we'll be doing our part in helping the covering then of sin. Galatians 5, let's turn back there to Galatians 5. Verse 13 says, For you have been called into freedom, brethren. Only don't use this freedom for an occasion to the flesh. Rather, serve one another with love. So yes, we have been called to freedom. And when you think about the knowledge and understanding we have because of God's Spirit that dwells within us, and his op giving us an open mind to have understanding, we have much freedom with that. But yet with that freedom, that understanding, that knowledge we have of God and Christ and what's been done for us and what we need to be doing, there's a lot of responsibility also with that freedom. So as it says here, use that to serve one another with love. For the whole law is fulfilled in this, commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But verse 15 here it says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out lest you be consumed by one another. So we need to be careful about that. Again, to be using what we have, God's spirit within us, for the good to help one another, to help cover. But if we're not using it right, if we're not careful, then we can be devouring one another. Matthew 7, let's turn back there. Okay, let's, let's pick it up in verse 1 of Matthew 7. <clears throat> it says, Do not condemn others so that you yourself will not be condemned. So we, we've covered that. For with... For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you mete out, it shall be measured out uh, again to you. Now why do you look at the sliver that is in your brother's eye, but you do not perceive the beam in your own eye? Or how will you say to your brother, allow me to remove the slither from your eye, and behold, the beam is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first cast out the beam from your own eye, and then you shall see clearly to remove the slither from your brother's eye. So we, we need to be careful not to judge. And, you know, if we're, if we're not looking through our eyes in our heart, with love, being driven by love, love being the purpose for everything we do, that's a beam we've got in our eye. And as Christ talked here, uh, you're not going to see clearly. You're not going to see clearly. You can't have the understanding and the knowledge of how to handle and do things if you're not looking through the eyes that have love. It's a beam we have to remove. But you know, if, if we remove that beam and we are truly working on trying to use love to motivate us and all everything we do, then we're going to see clearly. We're going to be able to see clearly also to remove maybe a slither in our brother's eye and help them. But again, it's, it's love. Using love. It helps us to cover to cover sin. 
Matthew 18. You know, uh, like we talked about earlier, it's important to meditate on again what's been what's been done for us. So in Matthew 18, in verse 23, see a par parable here. It says, "Therefore there was a kingdom of heaven." Um, the kingdom of heaven is compared to a man, a certain king, who would take account with his servants. And after he began to reckon, there was brought to him one debtor who owed him 10,000 talents. So, uh, looks like this debtor maybe wasn't responsible, um, and he owed a lot. He owed quite a bit, so he hadn't, he hadn't acted too responsibly, it looks like. But it says, but since he did not have anything to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and, and payment to be made. So what a serious situation to be in where you're going to be sold, not only you, but your family too. Uh, couldn't imagine what your mind would be like to be in that position. It says, because of this, he, the servant, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, I, and I will pay you all. And being moved with compassion, well, we just talked about that, the Lord of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. So he heard this man's cry, how he cried out, and there was compassion and forgiveness giving there, forgiven there. The debt was forgiven. It says, then that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, and after seizing him, he choked him, saying, pay me what you owe. And as a result, his fellow servant fell down at his feet and pleaded with him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Sounds real familiar. But he would not listen. Instead, he went and cast him into prison, and he should pay the amount that he owed. So how sad is that here? This person was uh, shown compassion, and his debt was forgiven, and then he turned around and wouldn't even listen, wouldn't even take time to, this, to listen to this person pleading his case and asking for forgiveness and mercy. It says, now then when his fellow servants saw the things that had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went to their Lord and related all that had taken place. Then his Lord called him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you implored me. Were you not also obligated to have compassion on your fellow servant, even as I have had compassion on you? And in anger his Lord delivered him up to the tormentors until he should pay all that he owed him. Likewise shall my heavenly Father also do to you, if each of you does not forgive his brother's offenses from the heart. So we have to remember what's been done for us, the compassion, the mercy, the forgiveness. And as Christ said here, we need to be able to forgive from the heart. And if we have this attitude and we can remember what's been done for us and show that to others, then we'll be doing our part also in the help covering of sin. Well, when it comes to our brethren, and certain things that can go on and happen, uh, it's good for us to continue to consider ourselves and who we are and what we're capable of. You know, we need to be on guard. We need to be washing ourselves. We need to be careful. Let's turn back to Galatians 6 and read a little bit about here how important it is for us to consider ourselves. 
Galatians 6. Because again, our hearts and minds should be one that we want sin covered. We want sin removed. We don't want to dwell with sin. We don't want to see it in ourselves. And we don't want to see it within the church. We don't want to see it with, within the brethren. So Galatians 6, and I'm going to read verse 1. It says, Brethren, Paul writes here, even if a man be overtaken in some offense. So we'll stop there. Uh, and just ask the question, does this happen? Where within the church, within the brethren, that some are taken over with some type of offense or some type of a sin. Well, the answer we know is yes, it happens in the church with the brethren. Some fall into this, unfortunately. And, you know, we can go back and read 1 Corinthians 5 about the man there in the, uh, in the Corinthian church and what happened there. So, yes, within the churches of God, there are those brethren that are overtaken in some offense. It says, you who are spiritual that's the key all of us who have god's spirit within us who are led by god's spirit are spiritual it says restore such a one in a spirit of meekness considering yourself lest you also be tempted bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of christ and that is you know to love to have love for one another so we have to be mindful of this with, with our brethren, with our brothers and sisters, because sometimes sin occurs, but we need to consider ourselves and have meekness in restoring. And if we have this attitude and we are spiritual, as it talks about here, again, we'll be able to do our part in helping to cover. An important part there, too, in verse uh, 2 there of chapter 6 is bearing one another's burdens. And that's, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we that's what we do for one another. We do bear each other's burdens, and we pray for one another, and we help one another. James, the fifth chapter. Let's turn back there. James 5. Verse 19, it says, Brethren, if anyone among you strays from the truth. Well, it's a little bit about what we just talked about there in Galatians. Someone maybe falls into an offense, but it says, If anyone among you strays from the truth, and someone brings him back. And... Um, Maybe you've been in that position before uh, where you've been able to help someone that strayed from the truth and helped through love and through your actions to bring them back. It says, let him know that he who brings back a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall cover a multitude of sins. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that's a great thing there if, if any of us can be involved in being able to bring someone back, save someone, help someone that has strayed so they can have repentance and change and be in right standing with God again. That's so important. So maybe you've been involved in that. But it says here, it shall cover 
and shall cover a multitude of sins. So again, our part, because someone who's able to do this had to be loving, had to have extended mercy, had to have had compassion, forgiveness, and use wisdom and judgment in doing this. So we know when this happens, the credit goes to God and Jesus Christ for working through us and doing this. But if we have this attitude and we're doing things like this correctly, then as we show this, then it's extended to us, isn't it? We have mercy and compassion extended to us as well because of what we do for others. And again, yes, this has our part in the covering of sin. So one final scripture, and I want to go back to uh, 1 Peter 4. First Peter 4 and verse 8. So Peter writes here, it says, Above all, have fervent love among yourselves. So Peter and the other apostles, um, you know, they got to see Christ and what Christ did firsthand. They were there with him. They were eyewitnesses to Christ's life in his ministry, in his love, the love he had for people. And we know later on, they received the Holy Spirit within them as a helper, and a lot of things came back to remembrance to them, and they had a better understanding. One thing they understood, and Peter mentions here, they had an understanding of love, and that's why Peter said, among the brethren here, we need to have fervent love among ourselves because love will cover a multitude of sins. Peter knew, just like the other apostles, if love exists among us, then it will help cover sin. And that's all, that's what we want, brethren, is sin removed. And we want Christ to be able to return. And we want to be able to dwell with God and Jesus Christ and live with them forever in a world where love exists and sin doesn't. So I think the longer we're converted, the more we understand about love and sin. And what Christ and God have done for us and also what we need to be doing our part in the covering of sin. So, you know, we look forward to that time again, don't we? As we'll conclude the message here where we know that sin will completely be covered. It won't exist anymore. And only love at that time will exist in the kingdom of God. So we'll go ahead and close there.